In this lesson, I want to discuss a very specific type of political identity, one that is not usually covered all that well in textbooks, the question of religious identity. In the past 20 years, the question of politicized religious belief has been of particular importance in the United States for several different reasons. Since the late 1970s or early 80s, religious belief has become of increasing importance in the domestic American political spectrum with the presidential candidacies of first Jimmy Carter and then Ronald Reagan. And then later, the events of 9-11 and America's response to those events have highlighted the growing tensions between mainstream and fundamentalist Islam. So in order for us to talk about religion, I first want to begin by taking a look at a few definitions of the concept so we can better understand what we mean when we use the term. I then want to take a look at how religion is used by us, or rather how religion uses us, and then talk a little bit about how what happens to religion's role in politics changes as the state develops over time. So first of all, what is religion? Well, if you were to look up the definition of religion in the dictionary, you're likely to get a range of definitions that fall into about three different categories. First, many popular definitions often focus on the importance of some spiritual force or some supernatural deity. Second, definitions may seek to define religion based upon the attitudes or the practices of its practitioners, sort of um, how people actually practice the religions they believe in. Finally, many definitions might focus on or, or also focus on this idea of faith and the importance of faith to the practitioner or to the faith community. While all of these definitions are useful, they are also somewhat or somehow inadequate for the study of religion as it relates to politics. In his famous 1912 examination of the topic, Emil Durkheim tried to go a bit deeper into the concept of religion by creating a demarcation line between that which was religious and that which wasn't. As part of this examination, he identified four continuums upon which a set of practices or beliefs should be compared in order to determine which of these or which of these should not be thought of as actually being religious in nature. Durkheim begins by arguing that true religion usually contains aspects or elements identified as being sacred or kept apart from the average practitioner. Also, think about how in most churches, certain tasks like sacraments or marriage or communion are restricted to the clergy. Virtually all true religions have these these sacred religious rites that are typically viewed as an obligation of the members, but are ultimately carried out or conducted only with the help of the sacred clergy. Durkheim also drew a distinction between magic and religion, where the former places the control over the supernatural into the hands of the natural, into the individual practitioner of the religion or of the faith. Um, think of using sacrifices to appease gods or to drawing the spirits to do your work as examples of magic. Um, also, consider how many Christian churches try to make the point that it is God's will or God's power or God's energy that is responsible for answering prayers rather than trying to make the argument that they as the person who is giving the prayer or they as the person who is participating in the faith are actually responsible for the outcome. If I were to say that I was responsible for granting somebody's prayer, then that would be magic. Therefore, it can't be my prayer, rather God's intervention that is actually responsible. Um, lastly, think about um, another way that we could consider religion. Durkheim argued that religion is inherently a shared experience. The idea of a personal religion doesn't really make much sense to Durkheim, nor does it really make sense to the subject of, or the study of politics. If you have a shared religion, then there's this idea of you having an exchange with someone else, of you worshiping the same god or gods or deity or participating in the same set of practices. If you simply make up your own faith, you're really not worshiping what you believe, so much as it is that you're worshiping your ability to create those beliefs. Therefore, Durkheim didn't really think that personal religion should be classified as religion as a whole. Now, the reason why we need to think about 
religion from the Durkheimian perspective rather than using definitions we might traditionally or typically find in a, in a dictionary, is that his paradigm allows us to make a lot more sense of the interaction between religion and politics. For example, one thing that becomes clear to us is that politicized religion often centers on a desire to transfer the city of man into, or transform the city of man into what St. Augustus would call the city of God, to somehow make that which is profane, what is here and natural and secular, into that which is sacred. Now, what this means is that when religious leaders become politicized, they often use religion, or rather they often use politics as a way of trying to purify society or reforming society to remove or eliminate immoral behaviors and practices from what is generally accepted. And what we also see is they also try to ensure that religion maintains effective control over that which is sacred, particularly over sacred rights. So in all states where religion is politicized, we'll see definitions like marriage or life or morality being fought over by religious leaders. And the same thing is obviously true in the United States and in most of the Western world. Another thing that using Durkheim's definition gets for us is that we begin to understand that religious leaders are often trying to downplay the uh, use of terms like rational or scientific or modern when they're making arguments that can be confronted by science or, or disproven by science. Um, think about the debate in the United States between teaching evolution in the classroom or teaching creationism or intelligent design in the classroom. In, in, in this example, what you see is that scientists are basically trying to convince people to think rationally about evolution, whereas um, practitioners of faith usually are trying to tell you to, to ignore that which is rational and instead focus on that which is religious or your, your shared religiosity. Uh, third, what we also find is that states where religion or religious practices um, are very important are also a lot more likely to be able to solve the collective action problem. This might not necessarily make a lot of sense, but what we'll notice is that religious orders bring with them several natural solutions to the collective action problem, like a built-in hierarchy or previously existing sets of expectations or norms of behavior or, or modes of behavior or the way to allocate resources to overcome challenges, all of which are important to solving the collective action problem. And finally, also think about how if you have a state that is going to be challenged by some minority community or some minority population, usually that minority group is going to be more effective if they're operating from within a faith-based or a religious-based structure. And there are some reasons for that too. Um, religious communities often have physical spaces that can be used for organization or mobilization or education. They also have a way of educating their leaders because they're used to educating members of the clergy or lay people. Um, and therefore, they have a, a set of leadership outside of what we would think of through the state. And then they usually also have an independent source of revenue. So when they challenge the state, they don't have to worry about their revenue being cut the same way that a, a private citizen might. So now that we've thought about all this, what does this mean for religion as it relates to politics? Because religion is such a powerful tool, researchers, researchers have frequently asked the question, um, is the relationship between religion and the state good or bad? Is it a plus or a minus? Specifically, does religion make conflict more or less likely, or does it make democracy more or less likely? So far, social scientists have provided, with a couple, provided us with a couple of different answers or, or different ways of thinking about the answer to this question. First, a range of researchers like Robert Putnam have pointed out that religion can become a problem if social groups are heavily divided along religious lines, if the three or four segments of society don't participate in a shared religion. But in states where members of different religious groups frequently enact, or where it's relatively easy to move from one religious sect or one religious group to another, and what we find is that religion doesn't necessarily seem to pose a particular problem to the state. Putnam argues that it is very important when thinking about religion or how religion should, should operate within the state, it is very important to maintain a clear distinction between states where people are religious and religious states. 
In the former, members of society can be very free to adopt religion or engage in religious expression or, or practice their own beliefs. Um, in the latter, however, this isn't so much the case. What we see is that states can become dominated by a single religion so that that religion tries to use the state to its own advantage. Now, the difference between these two is, on the one hand, a healthy comp competition between religion and a free market of ideas versus a state that will try to manipulate uh, power or manipulate social groups as a way of trying to ensure that they get what they want or that they can maintain control of the public. A second perspective of religion comes from the world of someone like a Ronald Eaglehart, who, said, head, who heads up the World Val Values Survey. The WVS conducts surveys of people and countries around the world and it tends to understand what factors contribute to the beliefs that they hold or the, in, the beliefs that their cultures, their shared cultures, tend to identify with. The findings of the WVS suggest that religion and religious differences are relative to economic factors as well as being relative to underlying religious beliefs, such that the beliefs that a, a society holds or that individuals hold can tend to liberalize over time if the state's economic situation or security situation improves. What this suggests is that most values tend to belong to one of two large families or categories of value that trade off between traditional and secular beliefs on the one hand or a trade off between survival and self-expression beliefs on the other. Um, as this chart that you're seeing indicates, it is possible to group countries together based upon this set of social values or this social history. Now, notice in this chart that you can take a look at how some countries that sort of have a shared background, like Protestant Europe or English-speaking countries that have a, a history or a relationship with the UK, that they all tend to cluster together. But at the same time, the value rankings are kind of loosely defined um, and, in fact, can change over time. So you'll notice that Northern Ireland, which is clustered with the English-speaking countries, is actually closest to a country like Uruguay, which is in a completely different category. Um, one thing that we've noticed, though, is that as I look at how these countries are, are located on this chart, that their location, in fact, shifts and changes um, and has changed over the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. In countries where the economic situation has improved, or the economic situation has become more secure, societies have started to drift a little bit further and further to the right, trading off survival values for self-expression values. We've also noticed that they've become more tolerant of the kinds of expressiveness that are vital to democracy. It turns out, though, that the opposite can also happen. If I think about a country like Russia or Pakistan, which experienced significant economic upheaval during the 1990s or the early 2000s, what we saw is that they actually shifted from the right back towards the left, closer to survival values, um, as security became more and more important and scarcity became a bigger and bigger problem within the society. It also turns out that while this shift between survival and self-expression values does tend to track with economic development, the shift along traditional value and secular rational value lines appears to be a little bit more stable. While some countries do move around, but the reality is that most countries don't shift nearly as quickly as they do along the survival and self-expression lines. So what does this mean for the study of politics? Well, it means a few things. First of all, it means that we need to understand that identity of all types matter, including and especially religious identity. States that share the same identity or that have similar or homogeneous religious beliefs tend to be the ones that are most stable, but that isn't absolutely true. If you have an economically developed society or a heterogeneous state where people can move around relatively freely within a society, religion and other forms of identity can kind of demobilize. And it also shows one other more really important thing that kind of gets us back to the discussion in the previous lesson about the difference between primordialism and constructivism. What we can see is that shifts are possible in values, and therefore shifts are possible in identity, which means that conflict is not necessarily inevitable, or to the degree that it's happening now, it is entirely possible that within a generation or two that the very identity markers that bring conflict today may be viewed as irrelevant by the society tomorrow.